welcome to Myth Monsters. My name is Erin and I'll be your host for these little snack bite-sized podcasts on folklore and mythical monsters from around the world. These podcasts focus on the actual cryptids, folklore and mythic monsters from global mythology, rather than focusing on the full stories of heroes and their big adventures. I'll also be dropping in some references that they have to recent day culture and where you can see these represented in modern day content so that you can learn more and get as obsessed as I am about these absolute legends of the mythological world. Can you believe it's the last week of January? That came around so fast. Apologies for the radio silence this week too. I've managed to really injure both of my legs and my hips this week. So I've been almost bed bound since the weekend. So I'm very late recording this. I'm literally recording this on the Thursday. So it's almost like a live hello. I've had to drag myself to my desk. So I hope that this is okay. (laughs) And in this week, I'm going to convince you to never go into an English wood ever again and talk about a mythical ghost. And we'll make sure you never run off the beaten path ever again. You probably haven't guessed it, but if you have, it's a real well done from me. It's really deserved, as this one isn't very well known at all. It's called the Kuri from English, specifically more Southern English mythology. What is the Kuri? I hear you ask. Well, they're generally described as a ghost-like entity. However, they're referred to sometimes as goblin-like, but we know they're incorporeal, so they cannot be physically touched. Very much a ghosty kind of being. They are considered parasitic monsters, and they can only really thrive whilst inhabiting another's body in an almost possession-type way. This is where the monster becomes truly a monster. They haunt shallow or makeshift graves in the country wilderness, usually in woods or forests, out where someone has unfortunately got lost or injured on a hike and then died. Curry attach themselves to this grave, and then they just sit and wait. They sit and wait, And what are they waiting for? They're waiting for anyone to do exactly the same thing, to end up walking onto or nearby this unfortunate gravesite. Once the victim's done this, they attach themselves to the living host and the terror truly begins. For a while, the person is completely unaware that the curry has attached themselves to them. They usually hide and wait for weeks, sometimes even months before they make themselves known to the victim. They do this by invading the person's dreams, slowly turning them into horrific nightmares of the curry's face. The curry does have a face. Reportedly, it's the stuff of absolute nightmare. And so bad, the person will slowly start to go insane. Over time, the curry will start to impose itself into the person's real life by touching it with freezing cold, seemingly invisible fingers. The curry feeds on the fear of the victim, so the scareder they get, the stronger the curry gets to. Eventually, the curry will start to impose its face onto the victim's family and friends during random encounters, but the curry will only ever reveal itself to the victim, leaving them in a really tough spot trying to explain to grandma why they're screaming in terror at them. It's also completely isolating to the person. Not many people are going to believe that you've got some monster imposing itself on Nan's face, so this just adds to the pure insanity the victim is starting to develop in this stage. Unfortunately, this isn't the end game for the Kuri. It's not had its fun, and it really wants to try out something else for a change. And so they will promise the victim freedom in exchange for taking it back to its original gravesite. The problem is, is that these are usually these makeshift graves in the middle of nowhere and the person will probably not be able to find their way back to it again. So the curry leads the way, but it's not quite done with our victim yet, still. Our victim is now truly on the brink of complete madness. They don't trust their friends or family due to the face of the curry appearing. They're desperate to get rid of this creature. The curry will take them back to the woodland and encourage the victim to look around for the grave. However, it is just making them wander around aimlessly, slowly becoming more and more dehydrated, hungry, and to the point of being absolutely exhausted from their journey. The victim eventually dies by any of those means or just plain exposure. Whilst the victim breathes the last breaths though, the curry whispers to them that they're going to enjoy dragging their soul down to hell. Horrible, right? And the cycle doesn't stop there, I'm afraid. The new grave is then made for our victim, and the curry starts over, punching onto this one and waiting for someone to stumble upon this very haunted spot. Now, for etymology, there isn't a specific definition of what a curry is or why it's called that. 
However, the word curry means an unpleasant or unpopular person in Old English, which does make sense with its power to push away family and friends. However, there's also no defined history for this one. We do know the area in which they haunt is Dartmoor, specifically near Devon in the south coast of England, and it's home to many more spooky creatures from the same kind of time. The most famous of these monsters is called the Hairy Hands, which are very literally a disembodied pair of hairy hands. But it's an entity that's been haunting a specific road, the B3212, since the early 1900s. Apparently drivers have reported a pair of hands, completely disembodied and sometimes invisible, sometimes super hairy and gross, take control of the steering wheel or handlebars of their vehicles and drive them off the road into the bleak, almost marsh-like countryside of the moors. People have been reporting hauntings in Dartmoor around this patch for the last 100 years or so, and the legend of the Hairy Hounds is the most popular. Obviously, this is another ghost story from around the area, but there are so many more from this particular place in England. I really recommend looking up Dartmoor monsters. They're very, very cool. Dartmoor and the Devon area is known for its countryside. It's a big holiday destination, which is why I imagine this is linked to this area, especially in times of hunting, gathering, going into the woods and getting lost was a very, very real risk and people had to take to survive. And makeshift graves were certainly not uncommon. The only real life comparison I can think to this is the all round rule of respecting graves and the dead, which is in almost every culture around the world and certainly is something here in the UK, considering we very literally created Protestant Christianity for one of our kings to be able to divorce one of his six wives. I'm looking at you, Henry. But this is prevalent in so many cultures and religions worldwide that it's almost an unwritten rule that you do not disrespect graves. Here in the UK, there's also a thing that crossroads are haunted because in the 1700s and 1800s, people who committed suicide or criminals were thrown to the elements in unmarked graves at crossroads, so they have always been linked to unsettled spirits. We do see this in other cultures more intensely though. A good example of this is Native American grave sites and the so-called mythos that's linked to any kind of haunting around them that's featured in so many books and modern media parts that apparently it's checked in the US to see if your house is built on one so you can tell if it will be haunted. However, it's a grave site, so no house should be built on it anyway. Simple as, it's complete disrespect, especially if they're close enough to the surface to be found. Inherently, it's a racist and ignorant, really harmful trope, but it's still in so many movies and TV shows to this day. I'm actually going to post a really cool article I read about this, so keep your eyes peeled on the Twitter. But the difference with this monster is that it's a wilderness grave, and with that comes firstly completely not knowing it's there. Also, it could be there by malicious means, which generally invites evil to it. And lastly, it adds to the dangers and warnings of travelling alone and off the beaten path. They do say that shortcuts make for the longest delays, and have you ever seen a movie where they take a shortcut off of the path and all of them live, unless it's a kid's film? Nope. Another little trope of modern media there, but it's true. If Little Red Riding Hood taught us anything, people, it's to stick to the beaten path, no matter where you're going. So it's kind of a cautionary tale, this tale, to stick to what's safe and what you know by those who have been there before you. Although we could use the same idea for climbing Mount Everest, where people do it all the time, where we know that bodies are used to mark significant parts in the climb. So maybe that theory doesn't get us too far either. I do kind of wonder if there's a Mount Everest version of the Koori attached to all those unfortunate explorers somewhere, but who knows? On to cultural significance. We've got nothing for art today, I'm so sorry. It's just not known what this monster looks like, so it's not really covered at all. However, I did find some really cool independent art linked with these, but be careful, I stumbled onto Yu-Gi-Oh cards from this search, and I ended up getting really invested on them, because after seeing the monster Karibo from the series, I was obsessed. Dang it, childhood brain. For modern media this week though, I'm mostly going to be talking about things that feature disturbing graves and hauntings following this, as there's nothing specifically on the Kuri, I'm afraid. I will say that some of these mentions are set within those quote-unquote Indian burial ground tropes, so it might be worth a skip if you don't want to entertain that. These are not suggestions as always, they are just where they're mentioned. I will always say if I recommend something during this segment, so just as a heads up. For movies, we have films such as Coco, The Book of Life, The Grave Dancers, 
Pet Cemetery, Ghost House, The Amityville Horror, The Shining, The Frighteners, Crimson Peak, The Innocents and The Haunting. Personally, I really adore Coco, The Book of Life and The Frighteners. They're all absolutely amazing films and the latter is definitely a seriously underrated movie. Go and watch it if you haven't. Michael J. Fox is best. For TV, you've got The Simpsons, Family Guy, Scariest Places on Earth, Most Terrifying Places in America, Portals to Hell, Buffy the Vampire Slayer, Supernatural and Ghost Adventures. For video games, you've got Mortal Kombat, Five Nights at Freddy's, Batman Arkham City and Asylum, Fatal Frame, PT, Resident Evil, Phasmophobia and my favourite here is Murdered Soul Suspect. Again, another underrated bit of gold here. It's such a good game. You play as a ghostly inspector. Why would you not want to play it? For books, my recommendations this week are on British ghost stories because we have so many. It's amazing. I recommend Ghost Tales of the United Kingdom by Charles River Editors for all those lovely ghostly stories. And to get in all our haunted places, have a look at Britain's Haunted Heritage by John West for all those people who want to freak themselves out. I actually live very close to a haunted nuclear bunker, so that's quite freaky. Visited it a lot when I was a child. Not, just don't do it. Now it's time for Do I Think They Existed? Oof, this is an interesting one. I think because I grew up right next to the woods and was genuinely creeped out by the wilderness feeling of it, even though I was literally in the tiniest village in the world, I'm going to say maybe to this one. Now, this is only because I don't think something as intense as the curry exists, but I do definitely believe in a weird superstitious thing of sticking to what you know and making sure you're staying on the path of those before you. Although I am quite risk averse as a person, so that does kind of make sense. And before you come to me and go, Erin, it sounds like you're a giant wimp and you've never lived. Oh, I did, honey. I did it anyway. I rode a rope swing over a very steep hill with a busy road at the bottom and was completely unknown to anyone outside of my friend group. I've been the wilderness kid. I'm just not anymore. (laughs) I grew up in the same village as Bernard Cornwall and right next to one of the biggest Viking settlements in the UK. So my childhood was all about exploring old stuff and that's why I'm into all of this as an adult. I just don't partake in it anymore. But anyway, I'm very superstitious about respecting graves and the dead too. I think it's really awful to talk ill of the dead and bodies should 100% be left to rest in peace in an undisturbed and organised grave until they've rotted away and joined the earth again. I'm very for that and realistically, so is the Kuri. I just don't think this kind of spirit would exist purely for malice, but potentially you're opening up yourself to some serious karma and bad luck. It's actually our first time looking at a specific English monster, which is kind of wild considering I'm born and bred here, but it's one of those that I originally put in the first month of podcast when I started last year, but I think I was too inexperienced to actually cover it. I think now I've got into a kind of rhythm and place, I've been able to fill this out a lot more, so I'm very thankful for my experience and all of you helping me, supporting me along with that. But next week, we're going to be looking at the fabulous Phoenix from Greek mythology. Because it's been a while, I love the Greeks, and who doesn't love the Phoenix? Get reborn from the ashes next Thursday with me. But for now, thank you so much for listening. It's been an absolute pleasure. If you enjoyed this podcast, please give it a rating on the service you're listening on. I've got the Twitter for any questions or suggestions on what monsters to cover next. And I'd really love to hear from you. The social media handles for TikTok and Instagram are Myth Monsters Podcast and the Twitter is Myth Monsters Pod. But all of our content can always be found at mythmonsters.co.uk and you can also find us on Good Pods and Patreon if you want to help me fund the podcast, you know, if you feel like it. Also, just as a note for this week, I've created a YouTube channel with all of the episodes uploaded so far. I'm uploading them 15 at a time, as that's the daily limit. I've been working on it all week, but I've screwed up about 8,000 times, so there's currently one on there. Hopefully by the time you get to it this evening, or potentially tomorrow, I will have some more uploaded. But our handle there is Myth Monsters Podcast, because of course it is. But come join the fun, share this with your pals, they might love me as much as you do. But for now, stay spooky, and I'll see you later, babes.